Hi, my name is Conrad, and I'm here today to talk to you about building stuff with Docker. My talk is called Dropping Anchor, which is a little bit abstract, but basically because Docker is all about shipping containers and ships and boats and that kind of stuff, I figure this is a way to kind of keep you sane and level. So I have a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with deployments and hosting and basically these things on the screen. These are what I have tried to solve over the last couple of months. The first one is that deployments are really, really difficult. Um, anyone who has tried to do deployments on their own in between trying to do actual development, bug fixes, talking to customers, talking to management, uh, you'll know that it's difficult and that it's not something that is fun. I'm trying to make it more fun. It's not quite there yet, but it's less painful. Second part, clusters are even harder than deployment. It's, you can kind of deal with one machine on your own. If you can have everything running on one box where you've got your database and you've got you know, a whole bunch of uh, processes or something, you can just keep on making that box bigger and bigger and you, know, you can kind of keep on top of it on your own. As soon as you outgrow the size of one box though, it, things get really, really difficult trying to keep everything in sync between two different machines. What if one of them goes down? What if the database is up? What if the app is broken? All those kinds of problems. So I've tried to make a very simple cluster architecture. I don't know if I've achieved it, but it seems to be working for me. Um, now in trying to find something like this, I had a look at what's available out there. There's a few different projects. There's one of them called uh, Flynn. It seems to be the most promising. There's a few commercial things. There's stuff like Heroku, um, uh, Nojitsu, places like that. They've all done a pretty good job of applying these kinds of concepts in a commercial setting. But trying to get an open source platform for this is really, really, really difficult and it just doesn't happen. Especially if you have to do anything that is not HTTP. Nearly every single one of these solutions that you'll find out there presupposes that everything you're building is HTTP. You're always going to have a host header to tell the cluster what service you're trying to get to. If you're doing anything that is just a regular TCP connection or doesn't, damn it. Uh, thank you, Adam. <laughs> okay, if you're doing anything that isn't, I'm just gonna have to touch the mouse every now and then. Um, if you're doing anything that isn't HTTP, then sometimes you don't actually know just from the connection uh, you know, which specific tenant you're going to. Uh, so the proxy has to listen on multiple ports and that kind of stuff, and most of these solutions just aren't built for it. So if you need that, then you're basically screwed from day one. Uh, also, all of the stuff that you'll get that's open source makes different trade-offs in different areas. So some of them will be uh, really, really easy to use. Some of them will be really, really fast. Some of them will be really, really stable. None of them will be all three. So to kind of uh, understand this talk, I, I just need to cover two things, which I will try and cover as briefly as possible. Docker is the first one. Some of you are probably familiar with it. Some of you are probably not. The basic concept behind it is that you have a reproducible kind of snapshot of an application. So you specify a bunch of steps and Docker will run those steps for you and at the very end you end up with basically a disk image and a little bit of configuration. Uh, you can then take that disk image and you can run it on any Docker host and it's going to be exactly the same every single time. So you don't have to worry about uh, did I you know, configure this correctly in here this time? Did I put the IP in correctly? Uh, I forgot whether I changed the database in this from the production or the development version. It's always going to be the same. So you don't have to worry about that kind of problem, which is really nice. Second part of it is they isolate your applications very well. If you're running things in Docker, it's what's called a containerization system. It used to use a specific subsystem of the Linux kernel. Now it uses a few different things to achieve the same kind of goal. But basically, your applications actually run as root. But that's not bad because it's completely isolated from the rest of the system and you can't go interfering with other applications running in Docker or just other applications in general. You can't you know, go hit the kernel and get root on the outside machine. You can only interact with stuff inside your container. So it's basically, yeah, go ahead. You know, tear up your own garden if you want, but you're not going to hurt anyone else. Second thing that you're going to need to know about is etcd. 
again, uh, etcd is something that some of you might be familiar with, something that some of you might not be. It's a distributed key value store, as I have written conveniently on the slide. Um, what that means is that you can tell it to store a value at a specific key, and then you can get that value back. You can do a few other things with it, though. It has a little bit of a hierarchy. It has some things like uh, you can tell it to use a TTL for a key, which is a time to live. So you can tell it, OK, store this key. Uh, expire it after 30 seconds, you know, unless I tell you to delete it sooner or if I update that TTL in the meantime. So that way you can have things where you can store some information about services that you're running. This just one way that I'm using it. You can store information about services and containers that are running, and you can tell it, okay, expire this after 30 seconds. Then if the machine goes down in, you know, less than a minute, which is, you know, pretty decent, uh, the system will clean itself up. So you will no longer have those references and you won't end up trying to route to machines that don't exist anymore. That's another thing that's a problem with clusters and is really hard to manage manually. Uh, it also has observable changes, which means that you can ask it to tell you when anything changes on a specific key or a specific key prefix. So you can say, hey, etcd, let me know when any new services are added or let me know when any are removed or you know, if the port changes on this service or whatever, I want to know about it. So I'm using that in uh, some of the front end parts to know where to route requests to very quickly without having to poll etcd all the time. So these are the different bits of my cluster. I have Docker registries, which are, Docker operates with, um, with the disk image kind of thing that I told you about before. And the registry is where those images are stored. It's actually pretty difficult to get a registry running if you're using just the base kind of Docker registry software. It's really complicated. It's Python. Um, so Python isn't really a bad thing, but it is complicated because it's built on top of a whole bunch of other stuff. And uh, it's just really difficult to get running for no particular reason. Luckily, there is actually a Go implementation of the Docker registry in that same repository with the Python one. And I'm not sure why it's not the recommended way to use it, because it's incredibly simple to get started with. Um, I'll put links to that um, in a thing that you'll be able to download afterwards. But yeah, that's the way that you want to go. I have agents, which sit on different machines, and they actually run containers. They run jobs in containers. So you tell it, hey, I want to run you know, an instance of uh, this application. And it just runs it dutifully. Uh, then you have controllers. Controllers are the things that sit there and actually talk to the agents and tell them what to run. Uh, you also talk to the controllers in your everyday use of the cluster, because that's how you interact with everything as one coherent system, instead of having to talk to individual machines, which is what we're trying to avoid ultimately. Fourth part, proxies. Those are the things that sit at the front of the cluster, and those accept requests or connections from clients and eventually route them to the right places. Etcd kind of sits in the middle of all of these things and lets it all know about what's going on in the rest of the cluster. So your agents and your controllers will both talk to etcd. The agents will register their services there. The controllers will find where the agents are by looking at etcd. The proxies will look for where the services are by looking at etcd. So that's really what ties all of this together. So all of these things on their own, not that useful. But if you can get them all to talk to each other and know about what's going on in the whole cluster, it kind of becomes nice. Ah, also, all of these things, none of them have to be just one. You can have multiples of every single one of them. So you don't have to have any kind of single point of failure, which was another important thing for me because I don't want a box going down in the middle of the night and me getting phone calls. I'd rather stay asleep. This is the layout that I have. So you're the little happy face on the left-hand side because you're all pleased that you don't have to deal with multiple individual boxes anymore. Uh, the registry is where you push your applications to. And the controller is what you talk to. That's, that's all you really need to know about. Those are your only entry points into the network. Everything else just kind of deals with itself. You've got agents on the left, they're running the applications, like I mentioned before. They're also pulling the applications from the registry. You've got etcd up the top, which everything is talking to. 
and you've got your proxies over on the right hand side which are talking to your customers. Is that all good? I'll reference this again in a few minutes. So this is what the agent does. The agent announces itself to etcd. So it registers itself within etcd, says this is my host, this is my IP, this is my port, um, and then the controller knows how to find it. It receives job offers. So the controller, when you ask to run a job, because that's how you interact with the cluster, it will formulate a job offer, which contains a few different things that that job requires to actually run. So that might be, oh, I'm a high memory usage job. So I require two gigabytes of memory free on whatever host that I run on. Or it might be, oh, I need a lot of disk access. So I require an SSD or a very fast kind of SAN disk running on whatever host that I run on. So it will formulate that offer. It will then send it out to every single agent. The agents will look at the offer and they'll determine whether or not they can actually fulfill it. At that point, they will either respond with nothing or they'll respond with a bid. And that's the agent saying, hey, I'd like to run this job. Here's how much free memory I have. Here's my uptime. Here's my network usage. All those kinds of different little things. Then the controller will choose out of all of those bids which agent is either the most stable or the least loaded or whatever is the priority for that job. Sometimes you're going to want a box that doesn't go down very much. Sometimes you're going to want something that has a lot of CPU speed, all these kinds of things. It monitors Docker's, uh, Docker for changes to container state. So if a container stops, it wants to restart it. If it restarts, its port is going to change. So it's going to want to update at CD with that information so that the proxies can find it later on. It also stops jobs when you ask it to. This is all exposed by a, a really simple REST interface for me. Um, just to note, uh, this isn't going to culminate with me you know, saying, here's where you can download this, because I unfortunately wrote it all for work. Uh, but, hello. Um, yeah, so it'll stop jobs if you ask it to, if the controller asks it to. That's another thing that the controller does periodically. It just stops everything for no reason, which is actually a good thing, which I'll get to later. Controller, which I've mentioned a few times, it's kind of your entry point to everything. You talk to it and you say, run this job, run this application, all that kind of stuff, and it just does it for you. Or it tells you, no, I couldn't. You didn't have any agents for you. You need to start another one. And then every now and then, it will kind of just kill a random agent or a process or an application. Uh, this is so that if you have any applications that are misbehaving or maybe they have a slow memory leak or something, they will just eventually get cycled out and killed. Or if an agent box, like the box that it's running on, is running out of disk space, then it'll just get killed and cycled, and the next one that comes up will be all nice and fresh and clean. So third bit, proxy. It resolves an external endpoint to a service which basically just means in terms of HTTP, it'll be a host header. So the same way that you do multi-tenanting with multiple applications running on port 80, exact same concept. Looks at the host header, decides where to route it to. It's a little bit different for TCP. Not all protocols have anything like that. So based on information in the connection, you can't always tell what tenant you want to talk to. Or sometimes you actually can't do multi-tenanting on it. Uh, one example would be any kind of uh, proprietary like device protocol. Nearly none of them have any multi-tenanting capabilities. So in that case, it uses an IP and a port, that pair, to denote which service it wants to talk to. So you have a proxy, uh, which you might have an IP shared between several hosts using various network you know, features. And you just say, if you connect to this IP and this port, you'll always get forwarded to you know, a specific tenant of a specific service. It talks to etcd to actually find where those services are. So when a request comes in, it looks at the host header, and it's already been talking to etcd and getting updates about where all of the services are running. So it knows where to route your request to based on information in etcd. So etcd is really a central point of this thing, but not single point. Uh, if there are no instances of an application running, 
and they need to be when a request comes in, then it will talk to the controller and it will actually start an instance of that application. This way you can have applications die periodically and save yourself some money if you're running an application which only gets used once a week because it might get killed you know, a few hours after it's last used and then it's not taking up any resources while nobody's using it. Those are basically the components of it. Um, now, I am going a little bit over time here, but I was had a little bit of short time, so uh, I'm just going to revisit this. I know that I've blown through this really quickly, so uh, if you have questions or anything, feel free to find me or come up to me afterwards. Um, so, controller talks to agents, which runs applications. Agents grab applications from the registry. Proxies talk to the controller to start new applications if they need to, and they talk to etcd to find where those applications are running. That's basically the entire thing. Um, my hope is that by kind of documenting some of this stuff and talking about it, that other people will be able to build uh, systems based on these kinds of concepts. Because I know that when I was researching all of these things, the hard part wasn't actually writing the code, it was finding out about the different parts and how they fit together. So um, hopefully that helps at least someone here or someone watching this video. So yeah, um, thanks for sitting here and not throwing vegetables or whatever it is that people do when they hate other people. Um, and yes, feel free to come up and ask questions, but I think I need to get out of the way because someone needs to do a talk here in a minute. Um, so thank you. <laughs>